everyone. My name is Esme and I'm a producer for the How To Academy. Thank you so much for tuning in to what is our first event of the year. We're joined today by Dr. Megan Rossi. Megan is a registered dietitian and with a PhD in gut health, who's currently working as a research fellow at King's College London. She's coming online with us today to mark the release of her new book, which was out last week, Eat More, Live Well. Megan will be sharing the latest discoveries in gut science and guide you through plant-based eating. This talk won't encourage restrictions or fad diets, but instead will emphasize science-backed importance of a diverse diet. Megan's gonna present for about 40 minutes and then I'll come back on screen to ask her your questions. So if you have any thoughts or queries, you can put them in the Q&A box and we'll get through as many as we can. So without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Megan Rossi. Hello everyone, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here with you all, although virtually, on a Wednesday evening and it's great to see so many people interested in clearly my favourite topic and that is gut health. So over the next 40 or so minutes I'm going to share more about my new book Eat More Live Well and more around I guess the science behind it and the practical translation of it. Now before we uh, get into the nitty gritty, I think it's important that we kind of check in with what actually is gut health, because I think most of us have heard this in the headline multiple times, but actually what it is, is not often accurately translated. So this is where I'm going to get you all to have a quick think what you uh, would say gut health is. Who's going to say A, it's digestion, B, bacteria, who thinks it's about A, B and more, and who's going to be honest and be like, you know what, I'm not quite sure. I know it's on trend and that's why I'm here to listen. Now, obviously, I can't pry into computers and see your response, uh, but have a, have a couple of seconds to think about that. The answer is, of course, C. So gut health actually relates to the functioning of our nine meter digestive tract, so this long tube that delivers food from entry all the way to exit. And gut health is incredibly important for really three key areas. One is something we've known about for quite some time. And let's you know, the good old saying, we are what we eat is kind of not that correct. It's more, we are what we digest. Because no matter how healthy the food we put into our body is, if we don't have a good gut lining, we're not able to extract that, all those nutrients from our gut, from the food we've eaten to get it from our gut into our blood to feed things like our skin and our hearts and our livers etc so really to make the most out of our food and our digestion we need to have good gut health the second one which has become you know even more on the on everyone's mind is the fact that 70 percent of our immune system actually lives in the gut and this is why we're starting to see a wealth of research coming in highlighting that good gut health and good immune health really do go hand in hand because they're living together essentially but it's really this third element, which is this landmark scientific discovery. And essentially the reason why I wrote Eat More, Live Well, um, because it is really essentially <laughs> redefining what it means to be human uh, in that we're discovering these trillions of microorganisms are doing so much for our body. And I'll go more into that uh, specifically. So over the next 40 minutes, I'll quickly touch on understanding the gut a little bit more because I think that's quite important. We'll talk more about these microorganisms living within us. We'll talk about nutrition for the gut. And then I'll do a lot of the, I guess, the translation where um, I talk about more of this diversity diet and what that actually involves. So firstly, understanding your gut. Now, I like to start with this because a lot of us today are kind of focused more on, on what we're putting into our bodies. and We're making more mindful choices. But actually, once we swallow the food, we actually have no idea what happened. So it is worth, you know, sparing a thought to what actually occurs along that nine meter digestive tract. So digestion actually begins in our mouth, not only because we start to physically break down the food, but we have enzymes in our saliva, which start to chemically break down that food. We also have bacteria called our oral microbiome in our mouth, which also are thought to contribute to the digestion that occurs in our mouth. So putting those mechanisms together, there's some really um, powerful research that's been done, you know, many years ago, but it highlights the importance of actually chewing our food well, which I think not that many of us um, are really attuned to doing. So this study I wanted to share, uh, you can see in pink is when we chew our food 10 times compared to if we chew the same food 40 times. And you can see that when we chew our food only 10 times, actually, we really do malabsorb a lot of that good nutrition from the food versus if we're chewing our food 40 times. So that's just a, a little intro reminder around making sure we're chewing our food appropriately. And I talk a little bit more about that in Eat More, Live Well. 
Then once we uh, swallow our food, it goes down our esophagus into our stomach. Now, our stomach is very much like a washing machine because it not only chucks around the food, it releases enzymes and um, different types of acids, which essentially cleans the food. And then once uh, the food's reached like a puree consistency, it makes its way into this next tube called the small intestine, which is a ridiculous name because it's about six meters long so it's not small in size at all but this is actually where most of our food gets digested uh, so you can see the enzymes are released there so most of things like most carbs most protein most fat gets from our gut there and is filtrated into our blood system to go circulate throughout the rest of our body uh, anything that doesn't get digested in the small intestine makes its way into the final part called the large intestine, which historically no one really wanted to talk about because essentially that's where poop is made. But now we're appreciating actually the large intestine is something we all want to know about because this is where most of those trillions of microorganisms live, uh, which is called our gut microbiome. So on that note, our gut microbiome, it's not just bacteria. Now, I know in the media headlines, you probably are used to hearing that we've got these trillions of bacteria in us, but actually our gut microbiome includes things like back, um, the bacteria, yes, uh, but things like viruses, fungi, such as yeast, and even parasites, which, you know, historically we were, we were told to be scared of and to hate, and of course, because of COVID-19, we're even more scared of the word virus, but actually they synergistically work together to look after us. And that's what we're discovering a lot about these microorganisms is the vast majority, uh, you know, are there to protect us. Yes, there are some, you know, dangerous ones, some negative ones, um, but actually the vast majority living within us really do um, want us to, to thrive because in turn they will thrive, but we need to make sure we are looking after them. One of the other things about these microorganisms is that they not only outnumber us in terms of actual you know, number of bacteria compared to human cells in our body, but in terms of the genes, the skill sets, the things these microorganisms can do far exceeds that or what humans could do on their own in terms of hormone production, vitamin production, and all of these other mechanisms. There's thousands of different uh, mechanistic pathways that these microorganisms are doing. And this is why we appreciate that actually humans probably couldn't survive with out these trillions of organisms within us. And even if you are an identical twin, your gut microbiome is unique to you. So you, no one else will share your microbiome. And I think that's you know, quite an exciting thing is that we're appreciating that it's not just down to our genetics. Uh, genetics only have a very small role to play. Actually, much of our microbiome and, and uh, what, who's living in this essentially is really up to how we treat it. And I find that very empowering given that we are realizing how important our gut microbiome is for overall health. Now, when I was um, starting my PhD over a decade or so ago, I was trying to encourage my patients um, to start to think about their microbes slightly differently and to, you know, do a few dietary changes. And in turn, I, you know, they asked me, well, why should I, you know, what's it doing for me? So what I did is I created my microbes CV and I think it's helpful to share. So firstly, our microbes, like, you know, most people CVs say uh, that they have very strong communication skills, but our microbes, you know, honestly do, because there's really three mechanisms to which our microorganisms are thought to talk to all different parts of the body. And I wanted to share this because I think a lot of people hear about, you know, a gut brain connection. They think, God, oh, they're in very different parts of the body. You know, it sounds a bit woohoo. It doesn't really sound scientific, but there are these three ways which we think they're communicating. So the first one is via the immune system. As I mentioned, 70% of the immune system lives in the gut. So what happens if the microbes sense something's going on, they activate the immune system to then release inflammatory chemicals, which then can tell the brain that something's going on and to set off other processes. So I kind of think of that, me that mechanism or pathway as like an alarm system. The second one I liken to a mobile phone is where the microbes actually activate this nervous pathway. You may have heard the word vagus nerve or enteric nervous system. So it activates that and that zips up and it communicates to the brain that way. And then the third way uh, is what you would maybe lack into like the postal service where the microorganisms in our gut actually produce chemicals and that then gets packaged into our blood system. And some of them are thought to pass that blood brain barrier. So they're the three ways uh, that our microbes talk to, not just our brain, uh, although uh, that is one of the key, key pathways, but also other organs throughout the body. 
our microbes are also a very experienced bodyguard uh, in that there has been a body of scientific studies. So some of you who are into the science world may have heard of, of this group called the Cochrane Library. And this is um, a group of researchers where they take a, a scientific question and find out if there's good scientific evidence for it. So one of the questions they wanted to ask is, is there evidence for taking a specific probiotic for um, managing or preventing the common cold? So an acute respiratory tract infection. And what they did is looked at all the individual clinical trials, and there was 13 in this case, and they showed that actually, yes, taking a specific probiotic actually significantly reduced people's chance of getting the common cold. And if they did take the common cold, compared to the people who were given the fake intervention called a placebo, actually they reduced the duration of the common cold by about two days. So there actually is really quite strong evidence uh, for our microbes there. COVID-19, I think some of you are probably likely to ask me, so I wanted to put in uh, one of the studies that have just come out around that. And the, the science is suggesting uh, that having good gut health is not going to prevent you from getting COVID-19, but what it does suggest that if you do get COVID-19 or contract it, um, our micro or having a good diverse range of gut bacteria, so good gut health may prevent you for, from becoming severely unwell. So the scientific studies have shown that people who do need things like respiratory support seem to be missing some key bacteria which are, have anti-inflammatory uh, roles to play. Now in Eat More Live Well, I kind of break down some of that science and actually share a, uh, a personal case study of my husband who's an NHS GP and I talk about you know, him being on the front line doing home visits uh, back at the very start in, in January, February 2020 and what we did to really support his immune system using the science. Our microbes also have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. Uh, as I mentioned, they produce a wealth of different vitamins and help regulate different hormones, but they also are really important in drug and nutrient metabolism. And this is why we're starting to see that, you know, some people react differently to different drug therapies, um, as well as potentially different diet, dietary uh, mechanisms. So um, some people uh, may be aware of some of the, the science headlines around our microbiome in things like cancer therapy, where there are a number of really interesting research studies underway looking at whether people changing people's gut microbiome through diet actually indeed can help them better respond to different cancer therapies. Now, that is very much at the kind of research stage, but this is the sorts of things that are coming up that's really exciting. Um, uh, and I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about the translation of what sorts of diets they are suggesting or, or trialing at that point of time. And then also nutrient metabolism. So how we extract a lot of the nutrition out of our food, actually a lot of that comes down to our microbes. So you may have heard things like dark chocolate and red wine have got some health benefits. And that comes down to these plant chemicals called polyphenols. Now, the thing about polyphenols, if we didn't have gut bacteria, we wouldn't be able to absorb them because humans don't have the digestive capacity to absorb them. Um, so essentially, these, these different types of plant chemicals actually feed our gut bacteria and bacteria then enable these plant chemicals to have health benefits. Uh, and that's a really important thing that we're currently looking at also. Um, just to highlight around, you know, again, this personalized nutrition, it's a really exciting area. It's still very much in... Um, in research stage, but uh, some of the research, some of the work that um, our team did at King's uh, showed that not just the bacteria that people have in them, but the chemicals the bacteria are producing actually help people predict how they would respond to different probiotics and different dietary therapies. So that's kind of where things are heading. Um, and it is a very exciting space. Now, for those who are into social media, you hopefully will appreciate this slightly lame joke that our microbes are a verified influencer um, in that they've been linked to the health of pretty much every organ in the body. In fact, the research papers have shown that um, a gut bacteria imbalance, which we often refer to as gut dysbiosis, has been linked with over 70 different chronic conditions. And a lot of these key mechanisms come down to what we call things like the gut brain axis, the gut skin axis, the gut immune axis, gut metabolism axis, um, all of which I talk more in detail about in Eat More, Live Well. So moving on to nutrition for the guts. Now, when I uh, started my nutrition and dietetics degree about 15 or so years ago, um, what I learned is that yes, diet, or what I was told is that yes, diet um, was really important in disease risk. Um, and that was all through how food fed human cells. But it's this new pathway, which really is, I guess, re 
re-establishing our understanding of how diet can really impact not just disease risk, but also things like longevity. And that is through how the bacteria metabolize our food. And this is the reason, as I mentioned, why I wrote Eat More, Live Well, because it looks at these other kind of mechanisms, these other areas that we never really understood or never appreciated were important in terms of our food before. So things like the diversity of plants, things like food additives and these sorts of things. Um, so it's a really, uh, you know, I, I would say landmark uh, discovery that is changing, you know, our understanding as as dietitians and nutritionists about how food can impact our health. So another little quiz for you, just to make sure you're all still with me. What do you think our gut microbiome's favorite nutrient is? Who's going to say it's protein? Who thinks it's all types of carbohydrates? Who's going to say it's fiber? And who's going to say it's fat? Answer is dietary fiber, uh, which essentially comes from all our plant-based foods. Now, without getting too scientific, I know some of you really do enjoy the science. So I wanted to share a little bit more about why fiber is so important. Because I think you've probably heard in the media headlines that we need more fiber, we're not getting enough, and it's important for health. But I think when you have more of an understanding of why it's important for health, the mechanism, you start to, you know, implement the changes a little bit more um or well, you're more likely to so essentially similarly to what i mentioned before about those plant chemicals those polyphenols where human cells can't digest them the same goes with fiber so actually when we eat dietary fiber it travels through most of that nine meter digestive tract undigested so it can't get digested in that small intestine where things like protein and fat get digested and it gets into the lower part where thankfully the bacteria uniquely have the enzymes needed to break down that fiber and they break it down into these different types of chemicals and, and you can see here these are called short chain fatty acids and these then get into the blood system. And it's these that are, are shown to communicate with our other organs. So remember I mentioned the three ways um, bacteria talk to the rest of our body. This is kind of like the postal service where they package up these chemicals and they can uh, go and have their effect on things like our metabolism, appetite regulation, et cetera. The power of fiber. Uh, so I love uh, showing this paper because it, it was a really like it had so many people involved in the paper and it's a really strong statistic which showed for every eight grams increase in fiber per day on a population level, we could reduce our risk of heart disease by 19%, type 2 diabetes by 15% and colon cancer by 8%. That's only from eight grams of fiber. Now, I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, okay, well, what the heck is eight grams of fiber? I've got no understanding. So eight grams of fiber equals something like a potato with the skin on, some veggie sticks uh, with some hummus or a can of beans. So it's actually something that's really attainable for us to add into our diet every day. But I also appreciate these foods don't look very appetizing. Um, so essentially, this is where Eat More, Live Well comes into play, where one of the key things I've you know, discovered after being a dietitian for however long um, is that if food doesn't taste good, you know, people aren't going to implement these changes long term. And what we know about our gut microbiome is we need to nourish it in the long term. If we go on a health kick for a month and then you know, go back to our old ways, actually, we're not going to be having those long-term benefits on things like our mental health, heart health, you know, longevity, et cetera, that we know our microbes are capable of giving us. We need to make these long-term changes. So how we do that is making sure we make food tastier. Um, so these examples from Eat More Live Well not only deliver more fiber, but obviously more taste. Um, so I think the sweet potato jacket is 15 grams of fiber, which is like 50% of our daily requirement. Uh, and, you know, with the um, the bottom image, the butter bean hummus, like that's a, another really easy example of how you can blend down some legumes and add in, you know, a, a bit of nutritional yeast to get that flavor and then have some, you know, grilled um, caramelized mushrooms on top. It, it, the flavor is amazing, uh, even for people who say they don't like plants. And I'll talk a little bit more about that soon. <laughs> 